Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 589. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday, the 3rd of April, 2020. I don't know whether to congratulate you. I will congratulate you. You've survived at least two weeks of the pandemic, some of you more, some of you less. And it's just, it's crazy. And George, Gavin, and I are going to sit down and talk about the crazy because that's kind of what we do. We stare at the news and new, uh, Facebook feeds all day long and catch up on what's going on and try to offer you the perspective of the church, the perspective of Anglican Unscripted in all this chaos. And there's just a lot of chaos going around. Uh, the new chaos, I'm going to put up a quick headline because... I'm going to use the the full force of Wirecast for once. Uh, is you know now we have to wear a mask. Nobody said that before. I've been going out in public and getting my takeout food without a mask, and now all of a sudden I'm supposed to wear a mask. So I hope the uh, uh, the f the first two weeks I was uh, offering enough six foot distance. It, let me describe for you what we do once in a while. Every night, Jill and I get takeout from our local dineries here because we want to keep them in business. So last night I went to Bonfire, which is right down the street, and we ordered ahead of time. They said, be here in 20 minutes, pick it up. I walk in. The only person there is the uh, reception cook person. I walk up. I put my credit card on the counter. I back up away. They go and take their credit card. They run it through, and then I put my gloves on, and I sign the little receipt thing. And it's a lot like being with the soup Nazi guy from Seinfeld, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get it, and he doesn't want to get it. But I, I love the food, and I want him to be in business in a month when this is all over. So that's Kevin, the crazy it, we're going to talk about. In Florida, liquor stores have been deemed, deemed an essential uh, business and are open, and so now you can go into a liquor store wearing masks and gloves. <laughs> so Whereas in the past, if you attempted to do this, a shotgun would come out from underneath the counter. <laughs> well, in Connecticut, liquor stores are delivering. Crazy. That's what makes zombies. I'm surprised this epidemic has not turned out to be a zombie epidemic, but I think in a month or two, we will all be zombies because we're stuck in our houses. And uh, Gavin was just talking about uh, his daughter is taking online university now, and she's stuck in her room all day on the computer, which my kids do that all day anyway. It's uh, just nothing different. Gavin, how are, let's, well, first of all, before we get too far, please like, subscribe, do all the stuff you're supposed to do, share this episode. Gavin. Uh, Britain is probably a week ahead of um, the U.S. as far as, or behind the U.S. What's going on recently in the health news there? Well, it's becoming very interesting. Um, we have one or two commentators like Peter Hitchens, who's been, who've been mm -hmm. saying um, that, and he apologizes that Trump has used the same phrase, um, because over here that doesn't help you very much. But nonetheless, he's been saying that there's a real danger since we know so little about the virus, that the cure will be worse than the disease. And and Peter Hitchens is a, uh, a, a, a rather grumpy, clever commentator who is, is a, who's a wonderful contrarian. And very often he's a curmudgeon. Right. He's, a, he's a wonderful curmudgeon. He, he's, a, he's a contrarian curmudgeon. Um, mm. I'm, I'm working on that myself. I could, I could really develop one of those, I think. <laughs> But, but he was particularly quoting a guy called Lord Sumption. Now, Lord Sumption's a very annoying person. He's, uh, he was, as far as I was concerned, he was uh, anti-Brexit. And uh, he's one of the That's cleverest right. judges we have and also a very reputable historian. And Sumption has come out saying that, all, that although um, we're very, everyone is very worried about the toll in life, the, close, the closing down of our whole economy has costs that we know about that are really truly awful. Uh, they're awful in terms of of depression, uh, ill health. The impoverishment of society will lead to worse health care, worse water, worse education, uh, worse transport. Um, and therefore, we are we're we're damaging the body politic, the body economic uh, in a way that we we know about in order to make gains or to gain credit or to to find a solution that we don't know about. So, uh, he's, they're both uh, urging a great deal of care. I, I'm very pleased about that because I think 
um, as, as I've said before, there's a great deal of evidence emerging now that a, a far larger proportion of the UK have the virus without any effects at all. Uh, and although we have now over a thousand deaths, uh, in this month every year, we have over 50,000 deaths, I think, uh, so there's 25 or 50, um, a large, a, la a very large number. And, and the deaths that have taken place um, with with the virus, uh, what's the phrase? It's, it, there's a, it's co-mortality, is that the phrase? Uh, in other words, comorbidity, co yeah. George, very much. Um, it's the danger of being unscripted. I should have written it down beforehand if I knew I was going to talk about it. And what comorbidity means is that um, so many of the people who have died, at least 80 to 90 percent of them, were suffering very badly from something that was going to bring them to death very soon anyway. Well, what this means is if you have a much larger proportion of the populace who has the virus, and you count only the people who've been killed by the virus itself and not the com comorbidity figures, you're ending up with a tiny proportion of people dying. Now, that's always tragic, but we know that we're going to cause an enormous amount of damage by taking the measures we've taken. So interesting that people are watching Sweden. The Swedes are a strange country, but they've decided to not to close down, to ask people to be careful and to to well, watching the figures. So everyone is really watching how Sweden manages in these next two weeks, because there's just beginning to be a sense that we've taken the wrong direction. And one of the reasons I think we've taken the wrong direction is that people are not being a Christian cult culture anymore. We're terrified of death and we're so afraid of death that we're requiring the governments on the pain of voting them out of office to pretend they can protect us from it. But of course they can't. And so this is a, a kind of charade we're all entering into, a charade that faith would insure us against because we know we're going to die and we know we're preparing for heaven and, and we, we, we walk the, the the walk and take take the days God has given us. They may be short, they may be long, but the length isn't important. So at the moment, we're, there are people trying to have this debate in England, but the media are terrified of it. They don't feel equipped, and so uh, they're not offering much of a platform for it. George, one of the things that really concerns me, and every country is doing something a little differently. Eighty percent are saying uh, we're shutting down and. Just stay at home, isolate at home. You can go get food, you can do necess necessary things. There are essential businesses, but we're shutting down. I was really concerned with what happened in India. In India, in just a moment's notice, they shut down all the transportation. And I want people to imagine India, you've seen how they load up the trains, people are on top of the trains to transport. They have really a, a different class system. And all these people who work in the towns don't live in the towns. Um, they go in uh, for their day jobs and they take these long train rides home, sitting on top of the train. All of a sudden, all the buses, trains, cabs, everything was completely shut down in India, causing what we're going to find out in three or four weeks is a lot of death. Well, the, in India, we have, we're seeing two phenomena arise. We're seeing, a, we're seeing this being understood as a Muslim disease. And why, why do I say that? Well, uh, there was a very large gathering, upwards of 10,000 Muslim clerics and religious workers in Delhi in the second week of March. And the government, even though they had put in place orders banning gatherings this large, because of the political ramifications of banning large Muslim gatherings, they let it go. And what has happened is that the coronavirus spiked after this meeting. And the reason why it spiked is that it was present among some people. It was uh, transmitted among the attendees, and then these people dispersed all across India. So the, must, so the coronavirus carriers in popular imagination are the Muslims who attended this conference, and they've gone all the way to the south, to, to Tamil Nadu, they've gone to Bangladesh, they've gone all over. And so it's being in popular imagination, it's fueling the latent Indian tendency to sectarian violence. Second, what it's doing is that the government, Prime Minister Modi, as you said, shut down all public transport and shut and put in quarantines. Well, India has millions of people living in the streets, and they come in from the country villages either to work as day laborers or they come in from the villages for months at a time and live on the streets and do casual labor selling things in the streets, doing day jobs, what have you, or some begging. 
And now those people are walking home because public transport, the train system, uh, has been shut down, buses. And as they walk home, what do they do? They defecate in the fields on the way home. Uh, or there's, so you're having a mass of humanity leaving Delhi, Delhi and Calcutta and Bombay and Madras moving back into their villages. And their the food supply isn't there for them. And the sanitation and the hygiene isn't there for them. So some Indian uh, health workers are saying, we are more in danger of a typhus epidemic from yeah. people urinating and defecating along the sides of the roads and in the streets, fouling the water supply than we are from, from uh, uh, COVID-19. And in South Africa, we see a, a similar thing, though different country, different culture. South Africa shut down the country, the prime minister, <clears throat> and ordered a stay at home order. Now that's perfectly fine for the middle classes and the upper classes who have homes to stay home in. Now, what about the townships? the massive uh, slum-like communities that started in the apartheid areas where the Africans lived and the, the whites lived in the cities and the suburbs. But now uh, those who have, those Africans who have prospered from the system now live in the uh, formerly whites only areas, but still the mass of the people live in these slum, massive slums. So if you have six or seven people living in a room, one family, and they're and they can't leave because there's their work has been shut down they can't ride the buses or the jitneys and their jobs were day laborers street vendors it's all stopped the i've seen on social media warnings from clergy i know who i'm facebook friends with in who live who work amongst the people outside johannesburg and pretoria saying that we're fearful of a social uprising, of violence in the street, because people will soon be starving to death. They'll be, the, the social compact is being wrecked. And for the poor in South Africa, for the poor in India, there is no safety net. The church is the safety net. Yeah. And the church, you know, is right now screaming, it's not working. And we're also seeing this in the Philippines, in Manila, I've, the Episcopal Bishop in the Philippines has uh, of Manila of Central uh, Central Luzon, which is Manila, is saying, "Look, the government has put in martial law, and people can't get to work, they can't get home, and they they don't have cash in the bank, they don't have three months food supply, they live hand to mouth, day by day, paycheck to paycheck, and that's all stopped, and there is no social safety net apart from what the churches provide in the Philippines." except if you're middle or upper class. Oh, so the social on. ramifications we're seeing in places like the Philippines, India, South Africa, I think are frightening. Well, the church is closed and that frightens me. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to transition to our next topic. Uh, we just saw in the last 10 days, mm -hmm. the church just closed its doors. The Roman Catholic, the Lutheran, the Methodist, the Anglicans, uh, when pressed, uh, somewhere said you could stay open. I, I guess in England, uh, they were offered to stay open, but they closed anyway. The, the church is closed, Gavin. Yes, a lot of people are writing to me saying they, they, they share our profound concern about this. I think the, the more that I've been reflecting on the relationship between uh, our society's uh, irreligiousness, it's, it's, it's hedonism, it's idolatry, uh, its immorality. Um, the the more I feel that that whether or not you attribute in a theologically direct way a virus to God, it certainly seems to me perfectly perfectly theologically sensible that uh, that kind of behaviour will lower our spiritual and physical protection to those things that endanger us. Um, and so. Uh, it seems to me one of the things the church should be saying to itself and to society is you need to get on your knees and get right with God. Um, apart from anything else, uh, you may die. And so you certainly want to do this in case this kills you. And even if it doesn't kill you now, you're not living in a way that uh, that is acceptable to God and your soul is corrupt. So you must get on your knees and make your peace with God. Now, you can't do that if the churches are closed. Um, and there are a number of people who are beginning at last to make noises in public 
there's a marvelous priest in the Daily Telegraph uh, who's written in saying, my bishop of the Bishop of London ordered me to lock my church on, on Mothering Sunday. I refused. It's open. It's staying open. It's, we're going to venerate the cross on Good Friday, and you can arrest me if you like. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens to him. He doesn't sound to me he's in the same bracket as the man George was talking about, uh, the, who was arrested in America. Uh, in the Times, there's a, a, an article that's been written as part of the comment section saying the churches should stay open in order to provide people with a place to go and pray, a place of refuge, a place of reflection. Uh, we we need more than the front room. Now, in, in fact, there's a, there's a bluff going on of a kind. All the supermarkets are practicing a form of really quite serious social distancing. In fact, here, if you want to go shopping, it's going to take you a couple of hours because the queues stretch for three or four hundred yards. And that's, wow. that's perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you, you know, there's 12, 12 feet between people or so as they queue. They allow, what, 50 people into a large store uh, as, as 50, 10 go in, 10 go out. It's rather tedious, but it preserves social distance. And particularly as there are studies now suggesting that the virus isn't transmitted by touch on surfaces, but is transmitted by face to face contact, uh, then social distancing does it that it, it is enough of a precaution now if we can do that for our food and we are doing it there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it for other buildings uh, and to have all the buildings open with the blessed sacrament uh, available our lord on the cross uh, and i mean if i was the bishop of diocese i would say to my clergy keep your churches open and have a rolling vigil so that when people come into church, they get to they get to hear the psalms being read. They get to hear parts of the prophets speaking to them from the heart of God. They get to hear the words of Jesus. Let them reconnect so that those people who are softened up by the Holy Spirit can make their peace with God. I'm very proud of this priest in London. I think he's done exactly the right thing. And I, I think that the, the clergy everywhere should write to their bishops and say, you've made a mistake. Um, please don't put us in the place where we have to be disobedient to you because the government were going to allow us to keep our buildings open as a matter of social policy. Why would you close them down when the government isn't enforcing it? Uh, and the answer is because they appear to have the mindset of health and safety bureaucrats rather than Christian priests and bishops. Well, I would Actually, also say it's a, I would, I'd say it's a lack of creativity as well. You know, they didn't think ahead, how could we do this? Or you could say it's a defective theology. Um, <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> it's defect in other words, the, in the United States, we had a pastor in Tampa who uh, has been a guest at the White House a number of times as an advisor to the president uh, when they have these uh, sort of show committees. And uh, the Hillsborough County, which is Tampa, uh, put in a, a no gathering order and he set out to intentionally violate it and gathered his church together on the Sunday with the intention of violating this order. And he was arrested. Now, he has since been released and the charges dropped because the government has put in, this governor has put in an order uh, uh, permitting churches to gather if you use these safe things. Now, I think the issue comes down to intent and understanding of why you're doing this. If you have a theological understanding of the real presence of adoration of that the church is a place of special holiness set aside by God that you cannot find anywhere else, then I can understand the motive and intent of somebody doing that. If you have a Protestant sensibility, then what you're doing is not theologically justified because you do not find God in a Protestant worldview in a place. You find him spiritually. You do not find him uh, in the bread and wine. You find him in, you, in your heart. And so for somebody to say who does not have Gavin's theological sensibility, I must go to church, then it's like uh, it's the same issue we have during wars when you have conscientious objectors. If you're a Quaker, if you come from somebody where there's a well-defined, or I believe Jehovah's Witness, where you have a well-defined theology that says this is why you may not participate in war, and then your run-of-the-mill Christian belongs to a mainline church and you just don't feel like going to the war because you disagree with it politically and you say, well, I'm a pacifist now and I'm a conscientious objector, 
well, that's too bad because your theology that you seek to do to defend yourself, you cannot all of a sudden become a Quaker once there's wartime. If you're an, if you're a, uh, an independent, charismatic minister, you cannot all of a sudden become a Roman Catholic in your sensibilities because you wish to defy the government to make a point. So let me, let me, let me so not it, is, it is not. It is. Uh, I, I'm now. I personally don't agree with Gavin's uh, worldview, but I'm not saying that Gavin should be prevented from exercising that choice. But very for those, but for those who set, who, but for those who do not share Gavin's worldview, I believe that's pride, that's egotism, and that has more to do with puffing yourself up than it does with actual being being faithful to a particular understanding of how God works in the world. George, that's, that's, that's much of that's true, and thank you for explaining my, my worldview. It was very helpful. But for about 20 years, I was a low-church evangelical. And, and the thing about low-church evangelicals is they love the word. And so you're quite right that the space becomes utilitarian rather than, than numinous. But nonetheless, the great thing about low-church evangelicals is they'll take any opportunity to proclaim the word. And so I would say to all the Baptists and the Methodists and the, U and the Presbyterians, open your functional buildings up and proclaim the word. Read out from the Bible. Let people come in and hear the words of Jesus and the prophets. So you're quite right. Um, the, the place itself doesn't, isn't providing a numinous encounter with the Holy Trinity in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But you can certainly use it as a functional place in order to provide a bridge with the, with the scriptures for the questing no. heart. For now, from a practical point of view, that really is not really that practical. If we lived in India in a village where we had no means of transmitting that news of the gospel, then then I think you would be justified. But in the let's just take the West, the United States, the UK. If you are a low churchman and you insist that this proclamation of the Bible can only take place from the pulpit, what you're basically doing is you are basically abandoning your understanding of how proclamation works through the heart of the believers and listening, and you're putting in the temporal quality of place and time. You cannot, practically speaking, unless you have a whole college of clergy on your staff, keep a church open for 12 hours with continuous Bible reading, because that is not proclamation of the word. That's just, uh, that that's not the same thing. That's not what how how the how a low church evangelical understands the word. Now I'm sure there are priests who can speak nonstop for twelve hours, and you can <laughs> rush ten people in and rush ten people out. So, but I'm not speaking now. I'm speaking more on. I, I'm I'm saying on a practical level, with the, uh, lot you know in our diocese the bishop has basically said. Uh, to us, you well, when are you guys just playing with your microphone? I hear it. In my you head. you can't have anybody come into your building, but do what you can mm -hmm. uh, to get the word out. And he's offered, season offered a number of advices. And here's where I'm so excited is that one of the things this really is, in some respects, I'm changing topics. I'm sorry, is the ACNA's hour because we're seeing yeah, we had a. Uh, how would, what George, would you, would, you give me, give me, would, you, would you change topics, but just give me 30 seconds to... to sure, to, sure. Um, I mean, you, you explained to me that, that I must have been a very poor low church evangelical, which explains my trajectory of moving, <laughs> moving where I've moved. But, but I, I think, I think you've, you've cooked the goose too much. Um, you, there was a wonderful show in London where a man called I think Alistair McGowan, I think, read from Mark's Gospel. He just stood on stage and read the gospel from beginning to end, and it had the most enormous impact on people who heard it. And, and, and Poirot, David Suchet, has the most fantastic reading of the Bible that you can download off iTunes. You don't have to have someone reading it live. You could, you could have the Bible read. But you, if you, you could simply, it, in order to, to, to allow elderly people out of their houses, where they're now ailing under house arrest, getting on each other's nerves and not getting enough, you could make the, the the church a place where you could go either either just have Bible See, I would say that would be irresponsible from if uh, I that would be irresponsible if it is only to have them listen to a tape recording to get them out of the house because they're bored and buggy that's irresponsible it has no theological justification under the sema that you've laid out if however you believe that you have to be in that physical presence of the of the sacraments yes it makes sense 
But otherwise, well, Gavin, you're, Gavin, you're talking about sentimentality and you're talking about emotion, emotionality. You're not talking theology or doctrine or Bible. If, oh, if, George, you, if that is your response for somebody who does not have a real presence understanding. George, the passionate evangelical in me just wants the word uh, uh, read out because it has no but anyway if we had a church when you and I were both pastors of nearby churches my church would have the Bible being read out all day to, to, to good or ill effect and yours wouldn't and people would have the choice but nonetheless uh, what I'm saying is that, that I take what you said earlier on that you can have a utilitarian space and I would love to fill it at times like this with the occasional reading of the Bible so that people wandering by looking because they can't go into coffee shops they can't go shopping and they've, they've only got the, the supermarket or home, could find somewhere else where they could go, and with any luck, find encounter God in some way. And I seem to have become pixelated. Yeah, your <laughs> camera went all freaky. <laughs> I, this is not a commentary from God on so, Gavin. It's so, just... Michael it, the Archangel, it, defend it, us in our day of battle. Be our yes, sick, this is... The wicked you know, snares of well, the devil. Come to our rescue, Lord. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to try and zoom in and out of that. And, uh, why don't you put your hand all the way up and block it and come back out? I think it just became pixelated. All right, now come back out. Uh, oh, yeah. There we go. Look at that. I oh, think. the healing done. Uh, it's called rebooting. You just rebooted your little webcam. So, um, I you were mentioning this is big up ACNA. Yeah, this is this has been a, a wonderful uh, time for the ACNA, which is kind of in my mind a younger uh, province they stepped up to the bat when it became overnight an electronic virtual church. This is not a universal statement. There are some uh, old line mainstream Protestant churches, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians individually. But as a denomination, what I'm seeing in the uh, ACNA and the what's the new Lutheran church the ACNA is linked friends with? Uh, um, I think it's ACNLA or something. It's yeah. Well, whatever, whatever it is, we're the hour has come for these churches to basically step into the public square and take up the slack that the main line has not been able to visualize how to do church in this time. And I really want to commend the staff, the ACNA headquarters, plus the individual initiative of so many of these clergy. We had the uh, gathering yesterday. Get Kevin, what? How would you describe that? It was a what well, did we Zoom. do? We, we we had a little Zoom meeting uh, with uh, some of our top viewers. We just put out a link. If you want to uh, join Anglican Scripted on Zoom, click this link. And for the most part. A lot of people watched because they didn't want to be a live camera, which is fine, no big deal. But a I lot was, of people, you know. I was particularly struck by a, a fellow who pastors a little church in West Virginia, little, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. And his web and presence, his, his reach and his contact is far greater than these thousand member Episcopal churches in the suburbs and in the cities. And Perhaps it's because he's a younger and he's of the uh, technology-minded generation, but there's a uh, the, the fire to get the word out, the fire to keep uh, the proclaiming the gospel. Isn't it's not just confined to the ACNA, uh, but there's a degree of uh, how, what's the word I want to use? Uh, well, they, they're trying to keep the community. flexibility. Trying, yeah, okay. they're, they're flexible enough to uh, to find ways to meet the situation. And in a funny way, this might be the ACNA's hour where they eclipse their older, more traditional rivals. Now, I've seen that. Now, as people know, for the last 10 days, 14 days, I've been offering uh, advice on how to live stream your church. And I've uh, spoken directly with many ACNA priests and uh, tech helpers. I've also sp spoken to 20 or 30 Episcopalians uh, priests who called up and said, will you help us as well? Of course. And... I got to tell you, the desire to keep their communities alive and being able to communicate over the internet is amazing. Nobody said, okay, we're closing doors and I'm just going to take two weeks off. The, the fellow in West Virginia spoke to the thing that Gavin was saying that were he still a low church evangelical, he would do. Where he, along with other churches in his uh, community area, basically have seven, eight hour blocks 
of time where they move from group to group, church to church, where we have prayer and praise and proclamation of the word. So it's, it's you know, if it's if it's just yourself and your wife running the church, you can't do it for eight hours, but you can, in essence, partner with others, maybe different denominations, different traditions. But that's happening on social media. Um, part of the problem I'm seeing in my diocese is is clericalism. Everything flows through the priest, and if the priest doesn't understand how this works, I just got my first Zoom account for the church yesterday because of the success of uh, Kevin's uh, get-together for Anglican Inc. Now this way I can gather the Stevens ministers. I can hold vestry meetings. We, we were doing it with conference calls like it's 1979. And conference calls don't work because you get one chatty person who you can't figure out how to mute them. But in other words, the, 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 the power that is being unleashed or the creativity, you know, let, let, I think the good things that are going to come out of this this experience as a community and as a society. Well, I mean, the church is being uh, called to called to account here, and I, I think different areas of the church, especially the young technical, are stepping up and say, "There's things we can do. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be like church was two weeks ago, but we can make up the gap." And we're making up the gap by having Zoom calls, by having online morning prayer online evening prayer, online uh, midday prayer, uh, and live streaming Palm Sunday and live streaming Easter. Now, we're, we're just days away from Holy Week, okay? And this is gonna be a big challenge. Palm Sunday, Easter. I've never missed an Easter Sunday. Never missed a Palm Sunday in 50 some years. Do I have to miss this one because of some little pandemic? If I if I'm in the Church of England, I do. Yeah, it's, it's or the Catholic that, Church or most churches yeah. around the it, world in Rome, which is also being really hit really hard by this virus. Um, I saw an article about Ron Williams uh, attacking the world's favorite uh, scientific atheist, uh, Richard Dawkins. I thought we could talk about that as our final story. Um, I met Richard a long time ago. I had a comp he was giving one of his book tours. Interesting guy. And um, Rowan said he's a philosopher. In none of his readings do I, do I see someone who's coming across as a philosopher, especially because in most of his paragraphs, he can include so many fallacies and so many errors that I don't think he reaches to the point of a scientist or a philosopher. However, he does speak very well lay atheism or popular atheism. And Rowan Williams said, this is ridiculous. The damage you're doing because you're not a philosopher and because you're not really a scientist is horrendous. Uh, Gavin, he's from your side of the world. Yes. You want to update us? Uh, well, the risk of being pretentious. Can I tell you a little story about a meeting between me and Richard Dawkins? I, sure. When I, I used to, to, to work as a senior lecturer in psychology and literature at my university, I, I was also a senior officer <laughs> in the bureaucracy, and so I sat at graduations in the front in my, my scarlet queen's cassock, <laughs> my doctoral robes. I stuck out like a sore thumb. And um, at one particular graduation, Richard Dawkins came, and we gave him an honorary doctorate. And during his speech, he just laid into Christianity and particularly made fun of American fundamentalists. Um, and uh, we were all going to have, we all had the sort of the senior members of the university had dinner together over between graduations. They're, they're, they're fun. People ate and drank quite a lot because you spend a lot of time on your bottoms. And as we were, it, it just so happened that Dawkins and I were in the same corner of the robing room. And so people were watching us because they saw I'd got cross during his his rudeness and speech. So I said, Richard, I, I said, you talked a lot of rubbish publicly. You did it very well, but it was it was untrue and, and, and anti-intellectual. And so I challenge you over our graduation dinner to a debate in front of our peers because you talk nonsense and I'd like to expose it. And then Richard looked at me rather huffily. He has big blue eyes and he's not very tall. <laughs> and, and he said, I'm not staying for dinner. I'm going. And, and, he, and he rushed out. So two... Two Nobel Prize scientists came over, sort of 
looking a little bit grum. And they said, Gav, did you just offend our mate Richard? And I said, no. Well, what did you say to him? I challenged him to a debate over, over the coming lunch. And they said, well, it looked like he ran out. I said, yes, it looked like he ran out. <laughs> well, we'll have the debate. Great, I said, let's go and have the debate. And so um, <laughs> over this two and a half, three hour dinner, we had a very raucous debate between science and religion. And we had a great time as we exposed the philosophical trajectories of, of the things we both believed in. Now, I didn't convert them, though I tried very hard, but they suddenly came away from that, realizing there was a far better case for faith and for Jesus than Richard Dawkins had led them to believe. And the problem with Dawkins is he's, he's a shallow, competent popularist. Um, I don't mean to say he's a bad scientist, although though he has some jealous colleagues who, who do say rude things about him, and as in academia, people always will. But but he's a bad philosopher. Um, I mean, any atheist philosopher always start, starts on the back foot because the Christian says to them, right, we have a problem as an atheist. Why is there something rather than nothing? And they go, uh, 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 and there's nowhere to go intellectually from that point. They have to ignore that to make any case for atheism. Um, now, Rowan Williams is, is a very clever man. He's much more left-wing than I am. Uh, I've, I've liked him a lot in the past but he, as an intellectual he's debated Dawkins and he's really knocked spots off him because Rowan's oh, very yes, good yeah. at being the different of the argument and Dawkins got better at it as time has gone by um, but, but mainly he's avoided arguing with people who are cleverer than him and the trouble with many scientists really haven't spent the time um, thinking about it. I used to love being at university because I'd meet some clever scientists and they'd see me as a chaplain and they'd <laughs> they, they'd think they could have an easy time. There were two two very famous evolutionary biologists who used to hang around in the art center waiting for me to come off work in order to beat me up over beer and I loved it. We had the most marvelous time and um, I held my own and I was very keen to convert them. I reckon I got quite close but Dawkins the trouble is Dawkins has given the impression, because so few people have stood up to him, that there is a case for atheism. Uh, and the case for atheism is, 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 is a, actually it's a very poor one. Um, you can argue about different kinds of theisms as we struggle to find meaning. The moment you begin to have a, 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 a conversation that involves meaning, you can't then predicate a meaningless universe, or you wouldn't be having the conversation with meaning in it. Um, so Dawkins has caused a lot of trouble. But as I've read uh, mm -hmm. online comments in, in newspapers at the bottom of, in the Times in particular, the bottom of religious um, writings, the level of ignorance and anger fueled by Dawkins's rhetoric is enormous. And the trouble is, although he's lost the intellectual argument, as Rowan Williams has said, he's won the popular rhetorical argument. And one of the things we've missed in the Christian world uh, is people doing what I was trying to do on this one rather restricted occasion, and that is taking the argument to to the atheist, because actually we have a far better case. Uh, the whole of the human condition calls out for meaning and for interpretation, that only uh, a picture of God and a picture of the Holy Trinity offers it best. We have so much on our side, but we've lost our confidence. and. <coughs> Populists like Dawkins have made it more difficult. I'm so glad that Rowan Williams put the boot in on Polish radio. I just wish more people were listening to Polish radio when he said it. Yeah. I mean, science does not disprove God in any way, shape, or form. None of the muses do. None of the things that we as humans have studied has ever shown that there is no God, and we are born with that innate desire to seek him. And I've never met a person, even an atheist, who doesn't have that, that desire to seek out an understanding of how we got here. And some people turn to science for the answer and turn to very poorly researched science as the answer. And Richard Dawkins is their champion. Yeah. So, yeah, George, you want to pop in on Richard? I spent five years as a hospice chaplain, and you got a chaplain whether you wanted one or not. And perhaps it's because of the United States, but maybe over 1,500, 2,000 people with who passed, who, who's, who, passed, who I passed through their lives in the closing months, 
I can only think of maybe one or two who were outright atheists. There were plenty of agnostics, and mm -hmm. then there were people who would proclaim themselves atheists, but wanted nonetheless the pastoral support that I would provide. So I, from a practical point of view, athe uh, my experience of atheists is, is uh, basically one of egotism, not reality. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the atheist that I would come across uh, in an extremist in the last days, they may not want to talk about God, but they wanted the things that Christian solace provided. They just didn't want the name Jesus spoken or God. But compassion, tenderness, listening, un, un, uh, uh, unconditional love, they were all for. So they wanted the product. They wanted they wanted the result. They just didn't want to go there through the the uh, through the language of church. I thought there was an element of of um, you're, you're you're right, George. They wanted the the fruit of Christianity. This is the whole po point of Tom Holland's book Dominion, where he he says that they're they're basking off the fruit of a system they're trying they've been trying to destroy. They're soaring off the branch from the tree that they're sitting on. But I always thought that the thing that atheists most exemplified was they they exhibited a spirit of pride that wanted not to be morally accountable. They want other people to be morally accountable. Yeah. They themselves refused to believe in God to avoid um, the, the humbling of being accountable. They were often very proud people, proud of their minds and proud of their independence. Um, with a, with with no sense of the perspective that they were codependent in so many ways, socially, emotionally, as well as intellectually, and this 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 raw egotism that many of them suffered from expressed itself in 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 atheism, which was intended to defend them from being morally accountable to anybody. So in one sense, it really, as, as so often, it really wasn't an intellectual argument. It was a it it was a spiritual twisting that lay underneath that probably responded most to prayer rather than argumentation as so many things do well i think one of the issues we've had you know certainly in the last hundred years is the prosperity that the west offers people don't turn to god in times of need as much as they used to and they turn to the richard dawkins they turn to the west and uh atheistic philosophers and scientists uh, to explain all the uh, heart's desires and answers they want because well, there is no mass starvation that's kind of been wiped out there is no um except for now in a pandemic uh, a, a need to turn to god and i i see a need every day but if you're just your average western uh, citizen you don't see that need until times like this i was listening that's exactly right and i think that brings us back to the, the one of the virtues that god may use a pandemic for i was listening to an economist the previous governor of the Bank of England, uh, talking to a, a priest I don't like very much, but I admire, called Giles Fraser. He does a podcast. And the, the Sir Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, was saying that one of the problems with economics at the moment is that it's predicated on managing scarcity. And there isn't any scarcity now. There's a lot of capital, a lot of money, a lot of resources, and economics doesn't know how to manage it. One of the things this pandemic might do uh, is to enforce some scarcities on people. And it's in a time of scarcity that people then begin to realize their need, their dependence, their, their contingency on God, which is always true in terms of our mortality, which is why they freak out about death and don't want to recognize it. Um, but, but, but maybe more true for other things that we need now as well. So out of the pandemic may very well come a bending of the knee and a melting of the heart. Uh, I absolutely agree. Um, just as we close out here quick, what did you guys think of the Zoom call? Was that fun? Something you want to do like once a year? Or, uh, it's not something I want to do regularly. I mean, it was a lot of fun. It's unique to see people. Uh, we had Australia represented. We had England, America. Um, it was fun and original. And for me, I just wanted to, I want to fill people's time with other things and uh, just looking at all the bad news. Here, here's the bad news. I'm going to show you. Uh, I don't want you looking at these websites all day long. I, I want to give you something else to do. And I think that's what uh, having a, a, a mass Zoom call did. It just took our minds off uh, the world for an hour. And uh, what did you guys think, Gavin? I, I found it very humbling. I was, I was just delighted that we, our, our colleagues, our internet colleagues were such 
competent, nice, holy, clever with it. Uh, very smart, yes. People, I, they were very, very smart. And yeah. I, my goodness, um, well, uh, what, what, what splendid company we're keeping. <laughs> <laughs> we have to up our game. These guys are really smart. <laughs> How about you, George? I enjoyed it immensely. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a format we might want to look, explore in future times is doing a one-on-one -on -one with uh, almost like talk radio. We could do uh, a town hall where we, you know, where we take right. one person offers a question mm -hmm. and discusses it for three or four minutes. We discuss the topic for three or four minutes, mm -hmm. and then move to the next and more scripted than unscripted. Uh, I agree. Uh, scripted in the sense of this is what we seek to do in this forty minutes, half hour. Yeah. It was really interesting. I do look forward to doing it again. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you'll be listening to episode 589 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you. Mm -hmm.